Hey, um, please welcome David Stanton uh, with his talk about um, the mixed network and cuts and post. Hi, uh, I'm happy to be here talking about mixed nets. I love talking about mixed nets. Um, <laughs> This is one of those few occasions where it's actually okay for me to talk about mixed nets for the next hour nonstop. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about it. Um, so in the past couple of years, I've worked for the Panoramics uh, grant project. It's an EU-funded uh, academic grant project to research and develop mixed networks. And um, the reason mixed networks are important is because we want to be able to protect the metadata in our communication. And the types of metadata we're leaking in all of our communication not only includes geographical location and the times and when you receive and send messages, but also your entire social graph, right? The sizes of your message, traffic analysis on per perhaps what you looked at, like there's website fingerprinting attacks. Uh, there's other types of traffic analysis. Um, like uh, things that can break Tor in a few seconds. This is one of the more, most sophisticated uh, let's break Tor using um, statistical disclosure, short-term correlation attacks. Um, these guys use machine learning to break Tor more efficiently. This is more f from the perspective of a very powerful adversary who has visibility into a lot of the internet at, uh, at, play at BGP peering sites, peering points where lots of traffic is uh, collected. Um, but uh, there's, there's other things that we can use to protect metadata, including mixed nets. But mixed nets aren't the only solution. There's um, dining cryptographer networks, uh, private information retrieval, um, uh, multi-party computation, uh, other things like that. Um, and th these things can actually protect the metadata from being captured by global adversaries, or at least reduce the amount of metadata that's leaked. They all have uh, interesting threat models that break down. And mixed nets also have lots of attacks. There's some defenses, and uh, a lot of our defenses mostly are partial defenses. Um, and so a lot of this stuff needs to be viewed from the perspective of, uh, every, there's this, uh, it's a stochastic threat model. There's some probability the system may not protect you in the way that you want it to. Um, so, and we'll get more into what that really means. And um, so here's a kind of overview of a, of a mixed network. So what we're talking about here is kind of like this idea that we can make an overlay network on the internet, similar to how Tor is we have um, some sort of public key infrastructure, but really this is a way to distribute some information about the network so you can connect to it. Um, and this needs to be a decentralized system. So in the future, we want to use a Byzantine fault tolerant leader election, um, this, this kind of thing. And uh, right now we have a directory authority voting protocol, which is um, very inspired by mixed minion and Taurus directory authority design. Uh, so, we just, so once we grab some view of the network, we can use the key material and the connectivity in information to send uh, nested encrypted messages. So mixed networks work different than Tor. It's a message-oriented communications network. So um, we're trying to protect metadata, so all the messages are the same size, and we have some uh, different ways we control the latency. So we need latency and to remove a layer of encryption to provide unlinkability. So we want each mix to provide some unlinkability property between the input and output messages. And so um, the encryption, the nested encrypted packet format we use, the Sphinx cryptographic packet format, is used to provide this bitwise unlinkability, right? Because we're removing a layer of encryption, the output messages look different. Um, but also, they need to be mixed with other messages. So if this is threshold mix, for example, as a threshold set to four, then the output messages have a 25% chance of being linked with the given input message. I mean, the you're not, it doesn't provide very much uncertainty with such a small threshold. Um, so in order to make use of this particular mix strategy, we would have to set the threshold to like 10,000 or a million or something. And this would make this mixed network very slow. 
the threshold mix would then have to accumulate a million messages before outputting even a single message. Uh, there are, however, like some variations, right? There's the pool mix, mix minion. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, there was this cool mixnet project, open source software project, that used a pool mix, and the pool has to maintain a specific size, a uh, specific number of messages in it. Um, so uh, if an, uh, additional messages are added to the pool, that number of messages is removed from the pool at random. So it selects a random message. So it's possible you, you could send a message through a pool mix, and it could stay in the pool mix for a long time uh, because of just being unlucky. Uh, not selected to be removed from the pool mix later with some pro uh, probability of that happening. I mean, so here we have um, this threshold mix. Um, there's various other mix strategies, and they have different anonymity, latency, performance trade-offs. Uh, and this, this is a pretty good paper that talks about it because they, they can actually show the functional trade-offs as a graph, and it lets you reason about it uh, differently. Um, now, if we want to attack this uh, threshold mix, the adversary could let a target message enter the mix and then send their own messages, right? And then they know that the, uh, the one message sent that they don't recognize is the target message. So it, if you think about it, a single mix is not much use for the anonymity properties we want. So what do we want from this mix? We want it to not snitch on us. It's like a VPN or something, right? If the operator of the mix tells the authorities uh, the correlation between all the input and output messages, it does no good to, to use this mixnet stuff. So this is why we have different mixnet operators participating in the network. And we have multiple hops through the network. And so you want to have a hop maybe in a different continent, in a different country, uh, run by a different mix operator, hopefully not both hosted on, say, fucking Amazon or some shit like that, right? You want different hosting providers, po possibly even different BGP, ASNs, uh, stuff like that. Um, so these are other operational considerations. Uh, so it's not just about one mix, but here we're kind of zooming in and we're taking a look at um, there's these n minus one attacks, and we can break the mixnet using it. They're pretty devastating. Uh, and as an attacker that doesn't control the mix directly, but as an attacker who controls uh, the upstream network providers, they have they can send a message or stop messages from being received or delay messages being sent into the mix. And so on, on your uh, uh, new mixnet paper from uh, 2017, the Lupix anonymity system. Uh, a lot of my work is based on this. Uh, Anya was one of the academic collaborators in the Panoramics project, and we uh, collaborated in the design of Katzen Post, which is the software project that I'm currently working on. Um, her uh, Lupix paper contributes a few cool ideas uh, and uh, combines a lot of uh, the older Mixnet ideas and uh, one of the things it contributes is this Poisson mix strategy. So this idea of a continuous time mix, where instead of having batches of messages being mixed, shuffled, and sent out, there's messages always continuously flowing through the network. And there's not any synchronized batch schedule of messages or anything like that. Um, and so there's some probability that some number of messages will be in the mix at a given time. You, you could calculate this. I mean, and there's... Um, the other property we get from using the Poisson distribution uh, process, we model the client's traffic as multiple Poisson processes, which are then aggregated together. So we have clients that have, um, uh, are sending different types of decoy traffic. Uh, so the decoy traffic adds entropy, it adds uncertainty for the adversary, right? Because it's indistinguishable from a normal message. Um, and so we have these, uh, so the two, the two main properties we're trying to talk about here is bitwise unlinkability and latency. And the third trick we mixnets use is usually decoy traffic. And 
um, if we were trying to attack a Poisson mix with the n-1 attack, what we would do is we would block all incoming messages, or at least delay them for a long time, and then let the target message enter the mix, and then after that continue to block all incoming messages. And in this way, the message would just stay in the mix as long as it's supposed to, and then it would exit the mix, and we would watch where it goes after that. And so that's tracing one hop of its route through the network. Um, and if mixes send loops to themselves um, like this, then they can possibly detect if they're under attack. Because if the adversary is blocking incoming messages, then the loop shouldn't get its own heartbeat message. It can send this heartbeat protocol message to itself. So if it doesn't receive its own heartbeat, then it's under attack and it can do one of two things. It can either send a, a lot more dummy messages which would um, hopefully confuse the attacker so that they, their n-1 attack doesn't result in success. The other thing it could do is stop routing messages for some period of time, uh, which would essentially escalate it into a denial of service attack. Um, so, uh, and so George wrote about this protocol a long time ago, and this idea was also, in, also incorporated into the Lupix design. Um, so the MixNet topology need not have route unpredictability. Uh, route unpredictability is something that Tor requires for their threat model, but for mixed networks, since we have this unlinking property between input and output messages of each mix in our route, that's this uh, a single honest mix is sufficient. Um, so all of these could be compromised, but if one of them is honest, or okay, if all but one is compromised, if, if one mix is not compromised, then you still have something, right? We still get this unlinking property. Uh, now, that might not be strong enough to protect you if it's only 100 people or 10 people sending messages. You're one out of 10 or one out of 100, right? So we have to pay attention to how much entropy that mix has or what is the anonymity set size that's moving through that mix. Um, also, there could be some uh, uh, other uh, ways to completely break mix nets. For example, if you're looking at all the messages coming into the mixed network and all the messages leaving the mixed network and correlating that with clients who are online and clients who are offline, you can watch clients go offline and watch them leak additional metadata and, and break, break things that way. So, um, so there's lots of attacks, um, but uh, I'm kind of digressing here because I want to actually finish talking about topology first. Um, so, so the reason the cascade topology is great is because it preserves lots of entropy in each mix and it, uh, you're, you're not depending on one security domain, right? Each of these mixes should be operated by different entities, so different multiple security domains. And so if one of, if, even if the, in, if the input and the output mixes are captured, you, you still have something, right? If you have an honest mix in the middle, you still have this unlinking property. Um, now, if we look at the free route model where any mix can talk to any other mix, what we have here is something more resilient to failure, right? Because if one of these mixes fails, the whole network it fails until we can uh, establish a new cascade that works. So free route could have many potential routes, even if some of the mixes have an outage. Um, and the problem with free route, though, is it actually reduces the entropy in each mix because... Um, if Alice is sending a message to Bob and Bob is simultaneously sending a message to Alice, if, if the message is being mixed in mix one over here, it's actually receiving these two messages, but it's able to distinguish between them because they, they come from different source addresses. There could be many messages from different source addresses, and this actually splits the anonymity set into multiple sets instead of just having one set. Um, and so the, these uh, academics came up with this, this new uh, mixed strategy, this uh, layered topology or stratified topology. And so all the mixes in layer one send messages to any of the mixes in layer two. So layer two doesn't have any distinguishability between the input that it's receiving. It's always going to receive something from layer one, any, any mix in layer one. So this preserves the entropy and it allows us to scale. So we can add mixes to each layer um, and we can add layers and we can, um, the providers at the edge of this route, the, the ingress and egress hops of this route, the first and last hops, they 
uh, are a provider, which is essentially a mix, a superset of a mix. Superset has more features. It um, has network services and queues and things like that. Um, we can also have a multi-cascade PKI. If we can distribute this using our, uh, multi, um, our directory authority, our, the way you get the consensus view of the network from the PKI system, if you can use that system to distribute cascades to the users, they could use a cascade for some period of time um, before switching to another cascade. Um, so there's some trade-offs with that. Uh, so as soon as you give users the ability to uh, select their own route through the network, you also open up the, uh, the possibility of systemic, epistemic attacks. So epistemic attacks when the adversary has knowledge of the user's knowledge of the network. If a user has a partial view of the network, then they would only send routes through that small portion of the network, and that um, they can be route fingerprinted. It, their routes can be distinguishable because it's obvious it's them. You're the only user using these particular nodes in the network, so it's probably you. Um, so this this reduces the. Uh, this this also is another way to leak metadata. Um, another way to uh, to essentially destroy the privacy notions that you want to achieve here for anonymity. Um, so the, another way to look at MixNet attacks is we can abstract away the entire MixNet as a single mix here. And there's just this net abstract idea of a network being a single router where it's receiving some input messages and it's sending some output messages. So at the end of the day, the adversary can l look at just the mixes at the edge and see which clients are online and are, are connected right now and, and which clients um, at the receiving end, which clients are receiving messages. They might, and these are probably maybe the same set of clients. Alice and Bob's are actually the same, the same set of users, perhaps. Um, and so here's an expanded view of this slide, right? Um, so if Bob goes offline, so, okay, if Alice, number, if Alice 1 goes offline, and we see that after a while, Bob 1 and 2 receive fewer messages, say 20% fewer messages, or some, some measurable amount uh, uh, fewer messages, um, that's beyond some standard deviation in the system, then it's obvious that Alice 1 was previously sending them messages, right? So by going offline, so some uh, metadata is leaked. So if Alice is sending um, some set of users some messages, we see that they get fewer messages when she goes offline. We can't pre prevent users from going offline, so we can't, uh, in, in, basically we can't prevent this attack, but uh, the success of this attack kind of depends on the amount of metadata leaked and how repetitive user behavior is um, and the adversary's ability to predict user behavior, so it's not always uh, that these converge on success. Um, so, another way to look at it is this sort of model where we have, where the line on the right represents the area of the network the adversary is watching. The adversary is actually watching individual messages go to each client. In that scenario, that's a lot of metadata being leaked. Um, because here we can, we can try to correlate the input messages with these output messages on a per client basis. So, even with decoy traffic, decoy traffic would add noise to that but it would, um, it, would, it would still be leaking some metadata. Um, but here, on the other hand, if we have the receiving end uh, be providers, which are receiving messages for thousands, tens of thousands of other users that have message queues stored on that provider, then this metadata here that's leaked is uh, less, a lot less metadata. This, this statistical information here being leaked from the last mix to the provider is um, less accurate statistical information because now we don't know which particular client is receiving that message. Um, maybe some apps facilitate this online chat thing, so maybe cer certain apps may have users that use, use it at the same time when they're both online. And, and then, then you, you would want to attack the system by seeing which users are online at the same time. And so, I mean, uh, there could still be user behavior issues that uh, cause it to leak additional metadata. Um, 
Here we have clients later asynchronously. Client later will, on will retrieve its messages, and it does so using this um, a traffic padded protocol. So the, inf the clients always receive the same amount of information. Jean-Paul only has one message in his spool, and uh, Ada and Nathan have d other uh, different uh, numbers of messages in their spool, and they all receive the same amount of information. So, I mean, simple traffic padded pro uh, protocol like this makes our client message retrieval protocol uh, leak less information. Um, and so clients will periodically pull for messages uh, from their local provider. Um, so, so the Sphinx packet uh, format is really inspiring for me. This is one of my first papers. Um, uh, my friend recommended I read this paper, and I said, no, I can't understand it. It has all these like Greek symbols and math-looking stuff in it. But then I saw Ian Goldberg put uh, his Python reference code online. And using the reference code and looking at the paper, I was able to understand it. And um, their packet format is a nested encrypted packet format. And it's called Sphinx because the body of the packet is encrypted with a wide block cipher. And at the time, the paper was written 10 years ago, um, Lioness was the wide block cipher that was uh, uh, recently published. Uh, uh, it was a new kind of thing. Um, this idea that we can, um, instead of macking the cipher text after you encrypt some block of data, you, you actually want the plain text to authenticate it itself. So in this case, you would put some tag at the beginning of the plain text. Like it could be all 16 bytes of zeros or something like that. Uh, and then when, when you decrypt the final body of the message, you look for that tag. And if it's there, you have the correct, uh, you have the correct plain text. Um, so if one bit is flipped in the cipher text, the, the output would be completely destroyed. Uh, many bits would be flipped in the, in the plain text output, which would be uh, destroyed. Um, so, um, this is used, uh, this is peculiar design because basically what we want is the ability to uh, give someone an envelope with the address cryptographically sealed inside it. So they can't know where the envelope is going to go, but they could use the key you give them and, and uh, encrypt a payload and attach it to the header and then send it through the network. So sending the Sphinx packet through the network is something that two parties compose, right? You compose the header and give it to your friend, and your friend composes the plain text, right? He takes the key you give him, encrypts the payload, puts the cipher text attached to the header, sends it over the network. So then this, um, this header has this uh, nested encrypted routing information. And we use this to do lots of different things in the mixed network, uh, potentially. Uh, but right now, what we're using it for is to specify the delay for each hop. And this is specific to the Poisson mix strategy that we're using. If we want to use a different mix strategy in the future, we can, um, we can not do that or do it differently. Um, the other thing it does is specify the next hop in the route. So each router receives its slot of routing commands, and it decrypts this slot, and it's like, oh, here's where I send it next. So each router is cryptographically transforming the Sphinx packet into a new Sphinx packet, and they're sending it to the next hop. Uh, they're delaying it for some period of time, so the message is mixed with other messages that are on the router. And um, the new Sphinx packet, which looks completely different and is completely bitwise unlinkable, is then sent to the next hop. Um, so if the adversary then captures your Sphinx packet as it enters the network, what they can do is uh, ask the mix, the mix operator to decrypt the Sphinx packet. And, uh, the, and they could threaten them with legal court order or whatever, get whatever legal action, subpoena thing going. And um, this idea, or, or they could just hack their computer. They can compromise the person's computer without them knowing. Um, and they could gain access to the key material. And once they have access to the key material, they can decrypt all manner of Sphinx packets coming into this mix and see where they're going to next. See what the ciphertext looks like and the specific message as it enters another mix. And they can do this compulsion attack over and over again until the com entire route is compromised. Uh, and once they've compromised the entire route, then they've linked the sender with the receiver. Um, so this type of vulnerability, it's really interesting to note that um, 
a Tor is actually more secure in this one way, in this one threat model. Even though Tor is trivially broken by a global passive adversary who can see both sides of the connection, uh, it's interesting to note that since Tor has a bi-directional cryptographic communications channel, they are uh, exchanging uh, ephemeral keys all the time and destroying their keys. Um, uh, and um, so they actually have greater resistance to this attack. Right? If some ciphertext is captured by the adversary and then they're trying to compel each operator in order uh, to decrypt it. Um, so uh, so it's, an, it's an interesting comparison because on the one hand, mixed nets are, have a stronger threat model, but on the other hand, um, you do want to be careful to have uh, trustworthy mixnet operators who know how to operate secure servers and spread them out to different legal jurisdictions in different continents and countries around the world and make it very difficult for the man to coordinate these police efforts, these police tactics where they would try to get a subpoena and take some legal action to gain access to the key material. Um, I mean, you kind of want it to fail off, right? Where you could use a tempfs to write the keys or prevent it, not, tell it not to write keys to disk, right? And then if you pull the power plug, you could destroy the keys that way. I mean, if you need plausible deniability uh, on the operator side, I mean, there's, there's probably some interesting things there. Uh, the main um, defense we have for this is making the time window of vulnerability for these keys smaller by having a key rotation protocol. So the, the PKI system, this semi-distributed, system, which in the future will be this BFT protocol. Um, right now, it's the directory authority voting protocol, but um, we're exchanging these keys for the mixes. The mixes publish their public keys in a mixed descriptor, right, along with their connectivity information. So what we'd want to do we, uh, is we can shorten this window. So right now, it's set to every three hours, but we can set it to, in practice, I mean, every 10 minutes or every 20 minutes uh, works fine as well. Um, there's also forward secure mixes, and this is an interesting trade-off. If I have a particular um, state I set on a forward secure mix, I can use this key instead of the public key that everyone else uses and transform my Sphinx packet to the next cryptographic transformation to be sent to the next hop using a, a forward secure mix where it destroys the key immediately after use. So it would make the window of compromise uh, shorter, smaller. But it also leaks information to this mix. Now, every time I use that state that on the key, maybe it's a ratchet, or maybe it's some other forward secure kind of key rotation mechanism here. Now I'm leaking this metadata to this mix. I'm saying, like, hi, I'm the same guy as last time, because I know about that thing that you also know about. And I want to use that key material in this next cryptographic transformation for this particular hop through the network. So um, it might protect you cryptographically, but uh, if this mix is compromised, then you're leaking this extra metadata to it. So I'm not even sure if it's even a good idea to use these. Um, I think it's interesting to point these out and, and say, hmm, let's think about it. Let's, let's talk about it and maybe use it. But I think more f a formal analysis should, should be done where we have um, uh, a stochastic threat model and we can see how adding this affects our, our margins of safety. Um, we want some, some assurances from the system, so we, we should figure out how to measure these things. Um, so uh, there's a bunch of other defenses that don't involve key erasure, um, like a multi-hop uh, routing path where the, the mix receives one message and like three messages get sent out. Okay, uh, it's not a full defense. It's kind of like, well, which, which one of the three messages was your message? There's also um, plausible deniable routing where even if the message hit, um, arrives at its target destination, it's, it continues on through the network after that. So you're not sure where its destination is. Uh, possible denial of writing. Um, there's a few other tricks in this paper, uh, but the point is that there's not just key erasure, there's other defenses we can have. But the compulsion uh, attack for mixed nets is, um, is pretty bad, right? Because it's a datagram oriented protocol, right? We don't have a bi directional comm channel through the network. We have a lossy data, datagram oriented protocol that, where each datagram is being cryptographically transformed. Uh, independently and 
uh, state is not being stored on each intermediary in the network. So in the Tor network, you're creating these bidirectional uh, cryptographic tunnels that are layered inside each other. And in the Tor network, each of these relays uh, facilitating your, your tunnels uh, need to keep state, right? They need to store, they're storing ephemeral keys uh, and other, uh, other state information. Um, so uh, we have other... Uh, here, another way to think about it is if we have a, a lot of messages to send through the network and each time we're choosing a new route through the network, if there's a mix in each layer of the network, let's go back. Let's look at the layers. Um, hold on a second. So if we look at um, these layers here. Uh, so if we have a mix in each layer that's compromised already, we don't know which they are, but each time we send a new message, we uh, are selecting a new route, and so we're increasing the probability of eventually selecting a bad route. Um, so that's bad. Uh, so this is kind of another trade-off, is we can just use a cascade for some period of time, and uh, if we send a lot of messages over this cascade, it's not increasing the probability of it being a bad route. Um, either it is a bad route or it isn't. I mean, it could change over time. The, the machines in this cascade over time could become compromised. And if, enough, if all of them are compromised, then we have a bad route. Um, but hopefully, like I mentioned earlier, uh, if we only have uh, one honest mix, we should still have this unlinking property between input and output messages. As long as the uh, boundaries of the mix strategy are fulfilled. Right? So the Poisson mix strategy, if the traffic in the network goes down, then the anonymity of the network also goes down because there's fewer messages in all the mixes. In a pool mix, um, the pool is always full of messages. So if it doesn't receive very many messages, it doesn't remove very many messages. So the network is slower, but the anonymity is always strong. So a pool mix strategy is a better trade-off if you're super paranoid and you want to have always strong anonymity, even if few people use the system, it becomes slower. This is uh, a mixed minions pool mix is exactly what you want for that. Uh, this trade-off here we're doing with the Poisson mix strategy um, is, is different. Uh, we're trying to uh, more uh, design the system to be uh, low latency all the time or fairly low latency. So, uh, so the, here's the cascade, uh, multi-cascade topologies talked about in these two papers um, uh, where Amir Hertzberg is one of the authors. And I'm, I'm a fan of these two papers. I, I like what they've done. I like reading other people's designs. There's a lot of other uh, decryption mixed network designs. And um, so they use the multi-cascade topology and they also have a reputation system that helps them identify um, uh, actors in the network that are lying about network connectivity. Um, it's, it's not the main threat model. I think the, for MixNets, the main attacks we want to defend against, besides these compulsion attacks, are the statistical disclosure attacks, right? These long-term attacks where adversaries are watching the network. Um, so this is uh, just a, a protocol diagram, um, kind of like the OSI network um, protocol layers. Uh, what we have here is uh, uh, an overlay network. So instead of having some physical layer, we have internet protocol is our, is our physical layer. Um, and our data link layer uh, in the mixnet to connect the different mixes together, we're using TCP with uh, a noise cryptographic protocol. And uh, we're using Sphinx. The cri Sphinx cryptographic packet format is more or less uh, the core uh, part of the protocol that routes messages through the mix network. And um, we, have, we can have some custom automatic repeat request protocols to achieve end-to-end -end reliability, but they have to be designed with care because you can have emergent um, properties. You can leak too much metadata. You can completely destroy your own anonymity if you design these uh, automatic repeat request protocols incorrectly. Uh, basically, if adversaries are able to predict what the client's going to do, you can, you can do some active confirmation attacks. Um, I think adding signal double ratchet, that's, that obviously uh, is easy to do. I mean, um, but, uh, and we have a sort of experimental messaging system right now um, that, that we're working on. Um, so uh, the, pic the guy on the left is Trevor Perrin, and he's uh, 
One, he uh, helped design the signal cryptographic, uh, the noise cryptographic protocol framework, and he also worked on um, signal, the signal messenger and the double ratchet protocol and all this stuff. Um, so we, we're using his noise protocol framework for our link layer. And uh, in the middle, that's uh, Peter Schwabe, and he was one of the people who worked on uh, New Hope Simple, and we're in the future hoping to upgrade to uh, Kyber, which is the key encapsulation mechanism that's um, uh, a post-quantum cryptographic key encapsulation mechanism. So we're mixing uh, this PQChem with X25519 uh, for our data link layer. The, uh, the cat on the left is uh, Yawning Angel's avatar on GitHub. He was one of the main developers in the beginning of this project, and he did a lot of work on this, uh, in the design and on the implementation. This design of this wire protocol is his idea, and he wrote the implementation as well. And um, so a lot of, a lot of the work, uh, we have Yannick to thank for it. So um, I wanted to mention this paper. This is the anonymity trilemma. I think this is a very important paper. So what this talks about, there's a kind of, there seems to be an inherent tension between uh, uh, bandwidth used, uh, latency, and the strength of the anonymity of a system. You cannot have strong anonymity system with low latency and low bandwidth. Uh, you ha the system has to give, has to budge somewhere. So you, if you're willing to send lots of decoy traffic, it might use lots and lots of bandwidth, uh, but you might have strong anonymity and may maybe fair medium latency, maybe. Maybe it cannot be low. Maybe it can be low, but not too low. Um, so, or maybe we can have some amount of latency, medium latency, medium anonymity, medium amount of bandwidth usage. I mean, we can adjust these things. So, um, uh, so th uh, these researchers and other researchers are working on not only establishing these uh, ideas about the boundaries of an anonymity communication systems, but also um, how to tune them, right? Like, can we build discrete network event simulators uh, to learn how to tune these things? Uh, so, Lupix uses uh, aggregations of Poisson processes. So, cool thing about aggregating a Poisson process with another Poisson process the, uh, is, is that uh, you get another Poisson process. You get the aggregate Poisson process. Um, so, it's very... So, in... In uh, the Lupix client model, we have three Poisson processes. Uh, Lambda D is the drop decoy messages. You just pick some random provider on the network and send your message, and it the, the provider sees that it's a drop decoy message, so it just drops it. So obviously, you're not fooling any attacker who's compromised this destination provider, right? The only type way this looks indistinguishable are from your provider on the network and to other nodes on the network or someone some external passive observatory, a, a global passive adversary, any, any of these um, actors can see that it's a message, but they don't know that it's a drop decoy message. Uh, you can also send loops to yourself. So in Cats and Post, the way you do it, you contact some service on some destination provider, it's a loop service, and it sends you a reply using a single-use reply block. So the single-use reply block is this uh, mechanism from the Sphinx header that I mentioned before. It allows for anonymous replies. Um, so if you receive your loop, now your provider uh, is watching your messages and your interaction with the rest of the world, the rest of the mix network. So your provider sees that you received a message, but your provider doesn't know if it's a real message or if it's a decoy message that you sent to yourself. So that provides um, some a, a privacy notion that uh, researchers like to call it receiver unobservability, and and these sort of there's these vague English phrases that k kind of try to in a hand wavy way sort of try to explain the privacy properties that you're getting from the system, what types of metadata we're protecting, um, and so in this case, uh, receiver unobservability means the adversary, even if the adversary is your provider or if they're an adversary somewhere else in the network, they can't see when you receive a message or, or when you receive a decoy message or a real message. It, it, can't, um, it can't be distinguished. Um, so lambda, P, it, lambda L is uh, loops to oneself, so lambda D are drops, lambda L is loops, and lambda P is the legitimate traffic you wish to send. You have a FIFO queue, 
uh, your application puts messages in the FIFO queue, and this MixNet client pulls them out of the FIFO queue and sends them uh, one at a time in the network. Um, the delay between sending these messages is determined by these Poisson processes. So if you think uh, one way to talk about these Poisson processes, probably I should have just started with this. Um, you can think about it as a, like a dice roll or some probabilistic event that's occurring in, in, a, in a continuous stream of these probabilistic events. And each of these, they're disjoint, right? They don't affect one another. Um, and, and these... Uh, and so we can tune these. So we're tuning for these probabilistic events on some exponential curve. And you want it to be able to tune it so that you can say that usually these events occur in this range here on the curve. Um, and so you can... Um, but sometimes there'll be some outliers, and, but there's lower probability of that happening. Um, so let's see. Uh, so we have these different... Um, we can have different messaging schemes. So instead of, so if Alice uses this provider to connect to the network, um, uh, she can retrieve her message uh, from a remote provider. So there, we have this idea of strong location hiding properties. So what we want to do is not only build mixed networks that uh, protect your communication from third party adversaries, but also from the people you're talking to. So if the party you're talking, and this sounds unfriendly, but it's a really friendly idea, actually. If I'm talking to somebody and their computer becomes compromised, why should my location be discovered by the adversary? The adversary might become, uh, might com compromise your communication partner's com uh, device, right? Uh, so then they shouldn't gain knowledge of your location on the network. Um, so, uh, consequently, there needs to be these rendezvous providers, these providers that you don't talk to directly, but you talk to indirectly over the mixed network. And so Alice can retrieve her message, um, and when the reply is going back to Alice, um, if the adversary compromises these rendezvous provider, uh, and then causes an outage for half of the receiving providers, this, this is a kind of active attack where, um, if Alice's behavior responds to that in a certain way, um, the sequence number may have been incremented if she did receive the response, or if she didn't receive the response, the same sequence number will be resent. So that gives the adversary an active confirmation. And each time we see which set Alice is in. Is she in the set on top or in the set on the bottom? So these two sets, so this is a binary search. So it operates in logarithmic time. But maybe it's still a game because if Alice only has a few messages. Uh, maybe she gets this cue hint that she only has a few messages yet. So th there might not be enough uh, search queries to, to finish it, right? It would have to continue next time. Um, so th th it's possible that uh, we don't know the number of steps uh, to win. Um, so uh, what's going on inside a client is, is that clients can have this, these timers for a retransmission, but the timer can be canceled, right, if, if the acknowledgement is received. Uh, and really, we, should, we need to randomize these timers um, beyond the uh, standard deviation of, of, of delays in the system, because we want to do is we want to make it uh, difficult for the adversary causing these outages, right? If the client is random, randomizing the retransmissions, then they, um, uh, they make it so the adversary has to delay for possibly a really long time. Um, okay, so inside the Cats and Post mix servers, we, we actually have a plugin system. The providers, you can add, um, you can add uh, services to them. Uh, so the service doesn't even have to know anything about the mix network. It just receives some input from the network, and it can send its response. Uh, and so you can make... Uh, these various services like Zcash. Um, uh, Anya Petroska, one of the, uh, the main designer behind the Lupix anonymity system, she also wrote this paper uh, called Extending the Anonymity of Zcash, where she talks about um, se um, uh, people sending uh, uh, transactions over a mixnet uh, to uh, then be submitted by, in, onto the blockchain. And this is actually, I think, a very... Um, uh, useful use of uh, mixed networks and mi not as interesting as messaging. Uh, I'm, I'm more privy to uh, uh, the messaging models. So brief, the way uh, our new messaging system works, it's called Cat Shadow. Um, 
Bob and Alice do a Panda key exchange. It's this password authenticated key exchange. It's facilitated by a server on the network. Um, we're going to replace the Panda protocol with a new protocol called Reunion, um, and um, maybe it'll be published, uh, or maybe not. But uh, anyway, we'll, we're, we're going to improve the protocol later. Um, but right now, what we have does work, um, but I don't recommend anyone use it. Uh, it's just a, it's a research project right now and very prototype quality code. But um, after Alice and Bob exchange some keys, they, they, during this key exchange, they also exchange um, a, uh, a location on the network to exchange messages. So Bob's uh, message is um, this... Uh, the same color as Bob circled down below is where he uh, checks for messages. Uh, so, um, after Al so after they do this key exchange, uh, Bob can retrieve a message, Alice can send him a message, um, messages... Uh, so, I mean, if Bob sends a serb, a single-use reply block to his rendezvous point, and it can reply with a message uh, that goes to his provider. The provider he connects to locally now doesn't know anything about his rendezvous point. Um, so this is a, a, a new messaging system that gives us some strong location hiding properties, but it's pretty high level. Like you, the, uh, you, there's no universal um, identifier for the users in the system. There's no spam. It's basically if Alice and Bob do this key exchange, they can talk to each other. If not, then they can't talk to each other. It's not. It doesn't at all replace email. Um, or uh, anything like that. Um, so it's maybe not as useful for everybody, but uh, it's, it's a good um, sort of proof of concept of what we can do with anonymous communication systems. And it's very much inspired by Adam Langley's Pond. And I'm uh, actually uh, extremely disappointed that he, uh, he came up with this nice messaging system that had traffic analysis resistance, where people could actually send messages to each other, and it would actually hide this metadata of who is talking to who uh, from the server and from passive network observers. And now that uh, that project has been abandoned, I can't recommend any message system to anybody. There's no, we don't have any secure messaging at all. Um, so if we don't want to just continue using Tor for our messaging systems, I think what we need to do is make new anonymous communication networks that have stronger threat models and that have some strengths when it comes to messaging. I mean, this is not good for high bandwidth or low latency, but it's pretty good for uh, other types of communications that don't have uh, low latency requirements. Um, we can achieve some amount of low latency if you're willing to do a traffic trade-off with uh, decoy traffic. Um, so, but I wanted to also mention, uh, we can also replicate uh, our message spools in the network. And uh, so uh, a colleague of mine has been working on a, a CRDT-based design for message replication. Um, we are uh, also thinking of using this cat shadow messaging system to make other types of CRDTs, these conflict-free replicating data types, like a collaborative text editor uh, could be done, and other things like that. So we can have chat, collaborative text editing, um, send cryptocurrency transactions, uh, uh, lots of things could be done. Um, and uh, there's these really um, amazing researchers, and they wrote the Anonymity Trilemma paper, and they are continuing to work and research uh, anonymous communication networks. And they have uh, recently uh, published a new technical report. Uh, they've published it on their website. It is website published on the web. So uh, not in an academic journal yet that I know of. Um, and where they talk about hybrid networks. And hybrid networks uh, give uh, really cool security trade-offs. You can actually make the network, you can take an existing anonymous communication network and turn it into a hybrid network. Uh, and where you're using some secret sharing mechanism uh, and you're, you're exchanging some messages out of band, outside the anonymous communication network uh, initially to establish. Um, so uh, they talk about it in this technical report. Uh, that's the name of it. Um, on that slide right there. Um, and uh, I, I think it would be nice in the future if we could implement some of their ideas. Hybrid networks seem like uh, an interesting direction for Cats and Post to go, to go in. Uh, Cats and Post right now is more or less a framework for implementing various types of 
mixed network messaging systems. We have uh, a plug-in system on the server side, and we're working on a plug-in system on the client side. So you can write bits of code on both and have clients uh, interact with, uh, with, with uh, a plugins that are running on the server side, or they can interact directly with other clients with uh, an intermediary queue or, or not, depending on their requirements. Um, so um, that, that is pretty much the end of my talk. Um, we have covered quite a bit of uh, attacks, and I may have forgot to mention some of the defenses. Um, but we do have partial defenses for uh, pretty much all the attacks I mentioned. Um, does anybody have any questions? I don't think so. All right. Then uh, thank you very much for your talk.